Welcome to another episode in The Appointment. Today we're going to be looking at a topic that's entitled Turning Back the Clock, Tracking the Sabbath Throughout History. All throughout time there have been attempts by people to pull the wool over other people's eyes. There have been attempts to commit fraud and to make something which is untrue seem to be true. For instance, did you know that one of the most famous, most admired and revered sculptor painters of all time, a man that many in the arts world look up to, a man by the name of Michelangelo, actually began his arts career by attempting art fraud. At the instigation of his patron, he sculpted a cupid, he aged it using certain techniques, he buried it in the ground, then it was unearthed and claimed that, wow, a Greek artifact had been discovered archaeologically. It was then sold off to Cardinal Raphael, who only discovered many years later that he had been conned and got his money back. And then there was the instance of the Turk. The Turk was a mechanical chess player, which was invented in 1770 by Wolfgang von Kempelen. And the idea was that you could play chess against an artificial intelligence. But here's the thing. It was found out 84 years later that there was no such thing as a mechanical chess player. In fact, there was a chess genius cleverly concealed inside the machine, a fraud, a hoax. And then in 1912, a man by the name of Charles Dawson in, an, in a town in England, East Sussex, called Piltdown, claimed that he had found what he believed was the missing link between apes and human beings. He said it was 500,000 years old and it became known as the Piltdown Man. Well, 45 years later, after the Geological Society had ratified it and said that it was legitimate, 45 years later, it came out that this was an intentional fraud, one of the most embarrassing situations for modern science and for the evolutionary worldview. And then, of course, there's the religious world. And I think we all know that the religious world is not immune to this kind of, these kinds of hoaxes and, and frauds. For instance, the donation of Constantine was a fraudulent Roman imperial decree, which was passed off as genuine for many centuries. The donation of Constantine was discovered in 1607 definitively to be a hoax when a, an authoritative Roman Catholic historian and cardinal finally admitted so in writing. Now many had questioned the issue for a number of years, but nevertheless for many centuries this key document that secured the papacy, its states and its political power was passed off as genuine. Well, I want to suggest to you today that that's not the only thing in the religious world that has been passed off as a fraud. The idea of the Sabbath being shifted from Saturday, the holiness of the Saturday, to holiness of the first day or Sunday is also one of those long-standing religious frauds that has taken the world by storm for many, many centuries. So what I want to do with you in the next few minutes is examine what does the Bible say about the first day of the week? And there's only eight texts in the New Testament that speak about the first day of the week. We're going to briefly examine those. And then we're going to move on to looking at history because here's the thing. I'm going to say this to you right at the outset. I cannot demonstrate to you from the Word that Sabbath is shifted from Saturday the seventh day to Sunday the first day. I have to go to history and to, and to uh, sources outside of the Bible because there is no biblical divine authority for the shift. So let's have a look for a moment at what the Bible says about Sunday in the New Testament. And here's one verse. It says, Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. Now, you can cross-reference this with Mark 16, verse 2, Mark 16, verse 9, Luke 24, verse 1, and John 20, verse 1. So out of the eight texts that speak about the first day of the week, five of them refer to the same instance, which is the resurrection of Jesus, right? He has been crucified on Friday. He has rested in the tomb over the seventh day, Saturday, Sabbath. And now on the first day of the week, early as the sun was coming up, he's experienced the resurrection. He's no longer in the tomb. The women come down to continue the embalming process. They find he's not there. And five of the eight texts about the first day refer to this very same instance. No indication in there of any sort of shift of holiness, just a historical observation that on the first day of the week, the resurrection happened, the woman came to the tomb, found the tomb empty when they were about to embalm the body. Right, let's have a look at another text. John 20 verse 19, it says in the New King James Version, 
Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. Now notice what that's saying. This is the first five texts that we looked at had to do with the early morning on the Sunday of the resurrection. This text is referring to the end of the day or near the end of the day on that same Sunday. And the Jews, that is the disciples and the, and, and the believers in Jesus, they are petrified that if the, if the Romans and if the Sanhedrin, the Jewish, the Jewish leaders, had come for Jesus, crucified Him and buried Him, that they would be next. They got the key leader and now perhaps they're going to launch an all-out assault to get rid of all the followers. And so they gather together in this upper room, in this, in this room where the doors are locked. They are there for their security for their safety. They're there in fear. There's no mention of worship. There's no indication that this was a Sabbath day or that they were resting. No, they were hiding. They were hiding out of fear that the Jewish leaders would come for them next with the power of the Roman state behind them. Okay, so that takes care of about six of our eight New Testament texts that deal with Sunday. So far, so far, no indication of a shift of holiness or of sacredness or of worship or anything of the like. The New Living Translation, in fact, says in John 20 verse 19, that Sunday evening. So more formal translations speaks about the end of the day, that same day, and the New Living Translation speaks specifically about it being that Sunday evening. So when we go to Acts 20 verse 7, this is where it gets a little bit interesting. It says, on the first day of the week, we gathered with the local believers to share in the Lord's Supper. Paul was preaching to them, and since he was leaving the next day, he kept talking until midnight. Now, this is an interesting text because this one, I'm, I'm going to admit to you, sounds on the face value as if there's a worship service going on. I mean, they are breaking bread. That's what the more formal translations say. The New Living Translation says they actually shared the Lord's Supper. So you could read, you could read the breaking of bread as simply sharing a meal together, or you could read it as the Lord's Supper, which would certainly have a very, very worship uh, sort of a sound to it, a worshipful connotation, right? So let's take that, let's take it that they had worship together on this, the first day of the week. What we want to notice here is exactly how this works. The first day of the week, we gathered with the local believers to share in the Lord's Supper. Paul was preaching to them, and since he was leaving the next day, he kept talking until midnight. Now, Remember, when we studied the Sabbath in creation, we noted that actually not only is the Sabbath the seventh day, according to the creation account, but the whole time frame, when, when we move from one day to the next, is different to our understanding today. We today go from midnight to midnight. So when midnight strikes, the new day has begun. However, in Bible time, the, the, the change of day is at sunset. So we go from sunset on Friday to sunset on Saturday is the seventh day Sabbath. So when it says here that, that he was leaving the next day on the first day of the week, they gathered together at the beginning of the first day of the week, which was in fact a Saturday night. So the Sabbath hours have been spent. They've come out of the Sabbath hours. Paul is leaving to go on his missionary journey on Sunday sometime. And so they've got one last opportunity with Paul. And so what happens is they gather together in this room. They, they, they share the Lord's Supper together. He preaches his heart out all night, right? Until midnight. We know what happens. A man is sitting there in the window. He becomes over, he's overcome with sleep. He gets, he gets, uh, he loses consciousness. He falls out of the window. He lands on the ground. He's dead. They rush down downstairs. Paul performs a miracle, holds him close. There's a resurrection that happens. They go back upstairs. Boy, now they're on fire, right? No one's going to sleep that night because there's been this amazing miracle that's happened. Everyone's praising the Lord. It's this incredible moment together. And so they go all the way, in fact, until daybreak, if you carry on reading the rest of that story. So the point is here that this isn't necessarily an indication of a shift of Saturday sacredness, Sabbath sacredness, from the seventh day to the first day. In fact, I'm going to read to you something in the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 42, to substantiate what I'm saying. So Acts, chapter 2, verse 42 and 46, and it says this, All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. Jumping to verse 46. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. 
Now, this is the account of the early Christian church. And I want you to notice this. These guys were so, their world was so shaken to the core by the resurrection of Jesus. They were just so absolutely, I mean, it changed everything for them. That for them, worship wasn't once a week. It, wasn't, it, was, it was not only on the Sabbath day. It wasn't only at the synagogue. It wasn't something which, which only happened at special occasions. They were so devoted and so committed as Christian brethren that they went to the temple every day. Every day they went to the temple. They went from house to house in fellowship, eating their meals together. When they're sitting around the table together, they would pass around the unleavened bread and, the, and, and, that, and that, that red grape juice. And just as Jesus had said on the night when He instituted the communion service, just as He had said, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of Me. Every time they passed around that bread, every time they drank of that juice, they were conscious of the death and the resurrection of Jesus. They rejoiced in what was a life-changing history of altering course of action that had been taken by God through Jesus Christ. And so they would go to the temple every day to worship in one another's homes, fellowshipping, communion regularly. But notice this, that didn't make every day the Sabbath. That didn't mean that the Sabbath was no longer the Sabbath. It simply meant that they were a people who lived their faith every day of the week. But the Sabbath was still the Sabbath. It was still a special day, a qualitatively unique day. And here's the thing. You can worship every day. I'm going to argue you should worship every day. You should minister to people every day. You should share the gospel with people every day. You should be, you should be, you should be praying every day. You should be praising the Lord every day. You should be thinking about the resurrection and the, and the joy that Christ brings into your life every day. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the Sabbath holiness has shifted from the seventh day to the first day. We have no indication of that. So all that's happening here in this text, coming back to Acts 20 verse 7, is that Paul is going on his missionary journey. This is their last opportunity with him. They want to hear him preach. He's a powerful preacher imbued with the Spirit of God, and he preaches all the way through the night. It's like a farewell. They're not going to have him around anymore. And so they meet after the Sabbath and continue their worship well into the night. But Sabbath is still the Sabbath. Then there's another text in 1 Corinthians 16 verses 1 and 2. It says this, Now regarding your question about the money being collected for God's people in Jerusalem, you should follow the same procedure I gave to the churches in Galatia. On the first day of each week, you should each put aside a portion of the money you have earned. Don't wait until I get there and then try to collect it all at once. Now again, this verse is used by those who are looking for biblical evidence to legitimize the Sunday Sabbath, Sunday keeping Sabbath. And they use this to say, you see, what's being spoken about here is obviously a collection, right? Collections happen in synagogue, in church, and so therefore they must have been meeting for worship. This is a collection. Well, read it a little closely. First of all, there's no mention of the word Sabbath. There's no mention even of the idea of a, of a synagogue or a public meeting. This is simply Paul writing to the, to, the, to the believers in Corinth, as he did, he says, to, get to the believers in Galatia. Their hard times have fallen on the, on the believers in Jerusalem. And so he's saying, let's pool our resources together so that we can support our brethren in Jerusalem. But I don't want you to give out of the loose change in your pocket. I don't want you to give on the spur of the moment. Over a period of time, at the beginning of every week, when you've come to the end of the week that's gone by, as you're looking to the week ahead, you know what's left from the previous week. You're anticipating the income of the next week. Here's what I want you to do. Very prayerfully, very wisely, in the spirit of true stewardship, in the spirit of true wisdom and compassion and love, I want you to dedicate a portion of your income to support the believers in Jerusalem. I want you to do it intelligently. I want you to do it wisely. I want you to do it uh, uh, intentionally and, and thoughtfully. I want you to do it so that it is so that we can maximize the benefit to the Jerusalem believers. You know, this text is nothing to do with worship on Sunday, nothing to do with the shift of the Sabbath. What this text is about is actually stewardship. If you want to use this text for anything, it should be to instruct people in the wisdom of of, of, of giving wisely and consistently. The, the idea here is that we are giving in a planned way with an intentional goal to be reached, which is the benefit of those who are uh, not as fortunate as we are. That's what 1 Corinthians 16 verses 1 to 2 is really 
all about. Not so much about the Sabbath, or not so much about the Sunday, I should say. Now, contrasting what the Bible says about the first day of the week, which is very little really, and I think by now, we, hopefully we've established the fact that that very little does not include any indication of a shift or of a, the, the Sunday becoming the holy day. Now I want to contrast that by looking at what the New Testament does say about the seventh day Sabbath. So Matthew 24 verse 20, these are the words of Jesus and He says, Pray that your flight will not be in winter or on the Sabbath day. Here Jesus is speaking to a crowd and He's saying to them, He's looking down in His prophetic gaze through the ages and He sees a hard time coming to Jerusalem. And He says to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, you need to watch out. You need to be careful. The abomination of desolation is coming. And by that he meant the Roman armies. Seventy years after, or in 70 AD, which is roughly 40 years after he's spoken these words. In 70 AD, the Roman armies come up against Jerusalem and ransack the place. It's total chaos and destruction. They break the temple down. They, they, they melt down all the gold. They take it away. They turn over every stone, which was exactly according to the words and the prophecy of Jesus. So Jesus, 40 years before this event, is anticipating it through His prophetic mind's eye. And He says to them, pray that when this happens, it will not be on the Sabbath day and it will not be on winter. Why? because he's anticipating that the Sabbath is still going to be in effect. The Sabbath is still going to be the holy day. You see, the point is, if Sabbath was going to pass away or move to Sunday, this would have been the time that, you would, that, you, that, that he would have kind of said, look, in the future things are going to be different. You don't need to worry about the Sabbath day. Only worry about the winter, because obviously winter is a hard time. It's cold. It's difficult to, you know, to flee, to, to be able to find things to eat, to be able to survive. So it makes sense about the winter. But it only makes sense that he would say, pray that you don't have to flee on the Sabbath, if in fact, 40 years after his death and resurrection, he anticipates that the Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath, will still be in effect and still be kept by the true believers. In essence, what Jesus is saying is that the seventh day Sabbath is as enduring as the seasonal changes are. Summer and winter will continue. The Sabbath day will continue. All right, let's have a look at another one. Acts 13 verses 14 and then 42 to 44, it says, On the Sabbath they went to the synagogue for the services. As Paul and Barnabas left the synagogue that day, the people begged them to speak about these things again the next week or on the Sabbath. The following Sabbath, almost the entire city turned out to hear them preach the word of the Lord. Moving on to the next one, Acts 16 verse 13. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the woman who met there. Then you read Acts 17 verse 12. It says, as, as was Paul's custom, he went to the synagogue service. And for three Sabbaths in a row, he used the scriptures to reason with the people. Here's another one, Acts 18 verse 4. Each Sabbath found Paul at the synagogue trying to convince the Jews and the Greeks alike. You see, all of those verses, they're very simple to understand. There are, there are heaps of verses throughout the New Testament, throughout the book of Acts, which, are, which is describing the first century Christian church. And, and, and nowhere, in that, nowhere in that history, nowhere in the epistles that come afterwards or in the account of the actual history of that first century church in the book of Acts, do you ever find a dispute about the day of the Sabbath? Now, you might say that's an argument from silence, but, but hold on a second. Paul was bold enough to suggest that all that ceremonial stuff that pointed forward as an illustration to the plan of salvation in Christ came to an end at the cross. I mean, when Jesus died, right, we know that the temple curtain, which was a big thick thing like this, was torn from top to bottom su supernaturally, indicating the end of that dispensation. We know, we know, for instance, that, that Paul had a big fight on his hands in the book of Galatians and other places over the issue of circumcision, which he was saying is no longer the symbol of entrance into the community of faith, this community that finds its, its origin and its purpose and its fulfillment in Christ. You know, when, when he did away with that, old, with that old Jewish system, there was a major fight in his hands. It consumes pages of the New Testament dealing with how we are saved, what's required and what's, what, what's not required. But there's absolute silence on the Sabbath day. And I think 
that the seventh day Sabbath was more precious to the Jews of his time than circumcision was. They wanted to stone and kill Jesus over issues regarding how Jesus observed the Sabbath. And yet Paul never has an argument throughout the New Testament about the Sabbath day. Why? Because all those verses we've, we've read, he is worshiping in the synagogue, in church, meeting with believers. And some say, yes, well, he was just doing that evangelistically. He was just there. He only went there to reason with the Greeks and, and, and the Jews about, about this Jesus Christ. Yeah, but, but if, he, if there was going to be a shift and a change, then in addition to reasoning about this Jesus Christ, which caused enough trouble in and of itself, which resulted in persecution, imprisonment, and beatings, then in, on top of that, you would expect there to be some furor over the Sabbath question. But there's nothing. And I'm suggesting to you that's because Paul had no burden to change the day of worship. It was not his intention, neither him nor Barnabas nor any of the apostles. In harmony with Jesus' prophetic vision, they were still keeping the seventh day Sabbath decades after the cross. That is the heritage of the early New Testament Christian church. The followers of Jesus worshipped on the seventh day of the week. They worshipped every day of the week, but it did not change the seventh day as the Sabbath day. So, I'm going to suggest to you that there has been a perfect storm over time between Jewish factors, pagan factors, and Christian factors that have come together to shift the Sabbath from the Saturday holiness to Sunday holiness. Now, when I say shifted, you will recall that it's a bit of a misnomer. You can't shift holiness. You cannot shift sacredness. We established that in the first presentation when we were looking at the Sabbath in creation. So just a quick review. We said that holiness, the principle of holiness, is always about the presence of God. Something is made holy because it is adopted into the presence of God, used for His purposes. Normal, ordinary things are declared in the Scriptures to be holy because of their association and relationship to the direct presence of God. If that in fact is true, then we know that, sa that, that, that holiness cannot be shifted from one thing to another at our discretion. Because you cannot decide the mind of God, the presence of God. The presence of God is determined by God's own mind and His own heart. He is in charge of His own presence, His own appearing and disappearing, moving and coming and going. So holiness as a symbol of the presence of God on the Sabbath day cannot be moved, by very definition, cannot be moved from the Sabbath to any other day except if God should do that, which would be indicated in the Word of God. But so far in our study of the New Testament, we have seen none of that indication. Sure, they met every day of the week. They met in people's homes, in the synagogue, in multiple places. They worshipped. They were consumed by this Jesus. They were on fire every moment of their lives. Amen and hallelujah. But the Sabbath, the Sabbath was still a special day of holiness and of worship. So Jewish factors, pagan factors, Christian factors over time lead to the shift from Sabbath to Sunday. For instance, the Jewish factors, persecution of Romans against rebelling Jews. What do I mean by that? Well, the Romans were in constant tension with the Jews. The Jews believed that they were the people of God, that this was their land. This, they, they were in the promised land and that the Romans were Gentile invaders. In fact, many of the disciples struggled with this concept. I mean, even after the resurrection, one of the first questions they asked Jesus is, when, when is the restoration of Israel going to be? You know, they're still consumed by this idea that the coming Messiah is going to give stick to the Romans, that he's going to punish the oppressor, that he's going to liberate them politically and geographically. And so every so often, a group of very zealous Jewish uh, believers would arise tired of Roman occupation and they would launch offensives against the Roman authorities, which of course were dismally crushed ultimately by the Roman authorities. But the, in the Roman authorities' eyes, they, they couldn't really differentiate between Christian and Jew. I mean, really, Christi Christianity was sort of a subset, a, a sect of Judaism, you know. So the difference between Jewish, Jewish believers and Christian believers was that they, the Christian believers believed in a man called Jesus Christ and the Jews rejected him. But they, they really looked very similar in the beginning in terms of their worship, right? And, and, and the Christian heritage was Judaism, except it had matured into the person receiving the person of Christ as the Messiah. And so it was very easy for Christians to, be, to get caught up in the persecution or the, the war between Rome and the Roman authorities and the Jewish authorities. 
And then, of course, we read in the Bible a lot about the Jewish hostility toward Christians. Of course, it was the Jewish leaders that instigated the crucifixion and the, 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 the death of Jesus. It was them who, who uh, went after the Christians in many significant ways. I mean, all the way through the book of Acts, you had the Jewish leaders um, stoning and, and, and um, whipping and punishing and locking up, incarcerating the Christian believers for their preaching and their proselytizing. So those are the factors, the Jewish factors. Then there are pagan factors. For instance, Sunday was a very familiar day due to the sun cults. Sunday symbology became very conducive to the idea of the sun of righteousness. So you've got the day of the sun, which is of course why it's called Sunday, because that's the, that's the planetary day that was devoted to the worship of the sun god in the ancient religions and so very much the same in Rome and, and in the time of the Roman Empire. So the, su the Sunday symbology as the day of the sun and then you've got Jesus who was resurrected on Sunday and he's the sun S-O-N and you've got the pagans worshipping on Sunday S-U-N. They sound the same and so they were very easy over time to kind of bring together and narrow the gap between a new Christianity and ancient paganism. Then we have of course the Christian factors which kind of overlap with what I've just said. The theological justification, the inauguration of creation We'll read about that in a moment when we start to look at the early church fathers. They said, well, you know, the very first day of creation, light was the very first creation on the very first day. And then you have Jesus, the Son of God, raised on the sun day. And so, and so uh, the, the resurrection. Then we're looking forward to a new world to come. And Sunday, they said, is the, the, the beautiful prefigurement of that. So you have these Jewish, pagan, and Christian factors mixed with Time resulting in a gradual shift from Sabbath sacredness to Sunday. A Roman Catholic historian by the name of Dr. Christopher Belito says, Sunday originally was celebrated by the Egyptians, the Greeks, and the Romans as the Day of the Sun. Christians transformed the Day of the Sun into a weekly celebration of the resurrection of Jesus, the Son of God. So notice, notice something that he's saying there. He's kind of validified the story I've tried to tell you, but he's also making a very important point there. It was not based on the Word of God. It was not based on divine revelation. It was based on the tradition and the instigation of human authority. Christians, well-meaning as they were, for all the reasons we've begun to describe and many more we're about to describe, well-meaning as they were, began to shift from worshipping on Sabbath, the seventh day of the week, to Sunday, the first day of the week. The custom of Christian people, that means tradition, that means human authority, no divine revelation, no biblical authority. So right now on the screen you can see a timeline. And I realize that the little icons there are rather small and it might look a little complicated. Don't be intimidated, you don't need to pay too much attention to it. In the beginning, we have creation. The creation event establishes the seventh day Sabbath as, as the very symbol of the Creator's power of the Creator's creation event, right? When we go all the way down through time, thousands of years, we come to about 331 BC. That's when the Grecian Empire, led by Alexander the Great, conquers uh, Medo Persia and really establishes itself as the new world superpower, right? That's 331 BC. Slightly before 331 BC is the era of classical Greek. Now the classical Greek era gave rise to the classical Greek philosophers. Names like Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. These are, these are men, these are names that are so well known even in Western society today because Western society today is based very much on the logic, the pattern of thought, the foundation, even our political systems are, are inherited from the, the reasoning and the, the, the philosophies, the thought processes of these classical Greek philosophers. So these well-known men had certain philosophical uh, ideas, which when Alexander the Great took over the world and what we call Hellenized it. That means he spread Greek culture. Greek culture became popular culture. Greek language became the popular language of the day. And hey, let me just emphasize how true this is because by the time the New Testament writers write the New Testament books, the Gospels, the very first Gospels, somewhere around 60, 65 AD, they're choosing to write 
in the language of the empire that has fallen to the Romans. The Romans took over almost 200 years before Christ. So 200 odd years after Rome has conquered Greece, what's still the most popular language? What is the language that the common person is still writing and talking in? What's the language Jesus would have spoken? Well, he would have spoken Hebrew and some Aramaic, but Greek would have been the common language. So you've got these Jewish believers, these Jewish disciples, Peter, James, John, and all the rest of them, Paul, these scholars of the Hebrew mind. And when they write the New Testament, they're not writing in the Hebrew tongue. They're not writing in Latin, which is the language of Rome. They're writing in the language of Greece. And not only was it the language, but the culture had become so infused. Yes, the Romans were in charge. They were politically dominant, but it was Hellenistic Greek culture and language that dominated common society. So, having established that, when, when, um, when these Greek, classical Greek philosophers, when their ideas became popularized and spread across the world, it intersected with New Testament Judaism. So, as I said, we've got Socrates, we've got Plato, we've got Aristotle, and the bridge, the man that bridges between these classical Greek philosophies and their ideas and old, old school Hebrew scholarship and thought is a man by the name of Philo. And of course, Philo is living from 25 BC to 50 AD. He would have been a contemporary with Jesus. He would have been a contemporary for some of the time with Paul even. And Philo was a Hellenistic Jew. In other words, he was a Jew by birth. He was a Hebrew scholar. He was a teacher, but he was fully immersed in, fully in love with, totally indoctrinated by the Greek classical philosophers and the Hellenism that had been introduced for hundreds of years um, before his time. Now, here's the thing. These two philosophies, the Greek philosophical thought and old school Hebrew biblical teaching, are they cannot be reconciled. They're at odds with one another. But Philo, and later on the early church fathers after him were so immersed in their culture of their day, just like you and me, we are so immersed in our culture that there are things we cannot imagine would be wrong. Unless there's a heap of evidence to convince us, we assume that what we have grown up knowing, that the culture of our time is the norm. It is, it is true. So Philo, he, he cannot even comprehend that, that the Greek philosophers and his Hebrew faith actually cannot be reconciled on certain points. What he's trying to do is marry these two schools of thought and schools of teaching. And it is this, this hybrid, as it were, that becomes influential to the early church fathers. In the Greek classical thought, the, the way that it influenced Philo and Arthur and the church fathers is they went to a very, very allegorical interpretation of Scripture. That is to say that a passage of Scripture can have multiple meanings. And you'll see an example of that in a little while, in a moment, as we read some of the early church fathers. So bottom line, bottom line, I know that's a lot to take in, but here's the bottom line. Early New Testament Hebrew thought has been hijacked by Greek classical and Hellenistic thinking that has been present for hundreds of years. It's so much a part of their culture that they're not even realizing that it is happening. And Philo is the bridge between the Greek Hellenistic thought the philosophers of a bygone era, and the present day New Testament church fathers. They inherit from him that kind of a, of a joining together of the Hebrew scriptures and that Greek way of thinking. And out of that marriage comes corruption. Out of that marriage comes compromise. Out of that marriage comes a, a reinterpretation of the scriptures. And that's what you will see in a moment leads to the ability to disregard the plainest statements of, of scripture in regard to the seventh day Sabbath and push ahead with shifting the Sabbath from the seventh day to the first day. So, the first apostolic father I want to introduce you to is a man by the name of Justin Martyr. He got his last name, Martyr, from the very fact that he was, guess what? Martyred. He died for his faith. Now, I want to emphasize this to you. Although I read some of their statements and I disagree with some of their statements, some of these guys, not all of them, but some of these guys were really, I believe their hearts were in the right place. I'm not trying to make out that these guys were necessarily even intentionally deceptive or intentionally out 
to change things in the Word of God. I, I'm simply suggesting to you that in the course of time, due to all these factors, the Christian, the pagan, the Jewish factors combining, the, the philosophical uh, infiltration of Greek thought into the Hebrew way of thinking and the Christian way of thinking, that they were, in a sense, victims of their culture, victims of their time. And instead of the Scriptures holding the highest authority, something else outside of Scripture took the highest authority and altered the meaning of the Scriptures. So Justin Martyr, martyred for his faith, a believer to the very end, he writes the following uh, to Emperor Antoninus in defense of Christians. This is about 155 AD. He says, Sunday is the day on which we all hold our co common assembly because, because it is the first day on which God, having wrought a change in the darkness and matter, made the world and Jesus Christ, our Savior, on the same day, rose from the dead. So this statement demonstrates to you this rather large story I've been trying to narrate for you. You see here some of the Christian factors, the way that the allegorical interpretation of Scripture, taking the creation account with a very creation account that establishes, despite the fact that the first day light was created, as he says, Despite that, in that same creation account, the seventh day is declared to be the holy day. He, he's basically reinterpreting the very creation account that establishes the seventh day to legitimize their first day observance. That's the results of this allegorical interpretation. We see him here referring to the day of the sun, which is also the day on which the Son of God rose from the dead. So you can see these Christian factors, this philosophical, uh, allegorical Greek thinking altering the interpretation of Scripture. This is 155 AD. He's writing to this emperor to justify why Christians are a great asset to the kingdom. He's trying to explain to this man that you don't persecute the Christians. The Christians are good for your kingdom. So he's, he's trying to accomplish a good thing. But in the process, he's, he's writing down what is obviously has become a practice amongst early Christians. I mean, if he's writing this in 155 AD, this must have already been happening for a number of years before that, right? Now, we know that the last apostle, we believe that to be the apostle John, dies somewhere around 100 AD. So 55 years after that, there's already, there's already some evidence that the early church, the apostolic fathers, are drifting away from that pure teaching of the early Christian church, the pure teaching of the early apostles. And I wonder if that's why, perhaps, I don't know, I wonder if why, that, that's not why Paul, in the book of Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, speaks about the mystery of iniquity, which will cause a great falling away in the future, but which is in his time already present and at work. Could it be that he's already perceiving this, this amalgamation of philo philosophical ideals, this no longer having the scriptures as the highest authority? Is he beginning to see that there's influences creeping in to change the original teachings of Jesus, to change the teachings of the diehard apostles and that first generation of believers who got it straight from Jesus? Is he beginning to see the mystery of iniquity already at work in his time? And so just a few years later, You've got evidence of that with Justin Martyr being able to say that Sunday, by many, is a common gathering for the purpose of worship and communion and the like. Right, our next character is Origen, 184 AD to 253 AD. He was an early Christian theologian, a man of great influence. He had some tremendous problems with his theology and later on in the early Christian church, some of it was regarded as heretical and it was dispelled. But he had the following to say, and this is just a classic example of the, what you're going to see here loud and clear is the effect of the allegorical interpretation of Scripture, right? He says in uh, his homilies on Exodus, he says on page 308, Because it is evident from the Scriptures that on the Lord's day God rained manna from heaven, and on the Sabbath He rained none down, the Jews may understand that even then our Lord's day was preferred to the Jewish Sabbath. Even then it was revealed that on their own Sabbath no grace of God descended to them from the sky, no bread of heaven, which is the word of God, came to them. Okay, what's he talking about? Right, he's referring to Exodus chapter 16. In Exodus 16, God has led the, the, the Israelites out of Egypt. They are in the desert. They've run out of food. They're starving. And so he performs a miracle of manna from heaven. 
Now, what Origen has done with his allegorical interpretation is he's equated that literal bread from heaven to the bread of the Word of God. Now, that's all right. That's all right. We have a precedent for that in Scripture. Jesus says, I am the bread of life, right, in the New Testament. That's okay. But what he's done is he's then gone and said, right, when God rained down manna, he rained it down for six days. On the seventh day, he gave no manna, but on the first day and every other day thereafter, the, the, the other six days of the week, there was manna. So what that means is, what that means is that even in the time of the Jews, even that time before they got to Sinai, after they left Egypt, with, even there in the heart of the Old Testament, God was already giving indication that although he was about to give them the seventh day Sabbath in the commandment, that actually Sunday was his preference. That actually Sunday they got bread, but Sabbath they got none. Now, the teaching of Exodus 16 is that the reason they got no bread on the seventh day was because on the sixth day, God gave them double the portion so that they didn't have to work. So they were provided for in abundance on the sixth day so that they could rest on the seventh day and therein was the blessing. He's completely disregarded that and made it all about whether you get bread or don't get bread on whichever day. And so his argument is that the seventh day is the most cursed of all because no blessing is received. He neglects the fact that the sixth day they had already received, received the blessing for the seventh day. Does that make sense to you? And so this is the kind of allegorical interpretation that is taking the early Christian church by storm and it's overpowering the plainest teachings of Scripture, reinterpreting the plainest teachings of Scripture to justify moving from a Saturday observance as a holy day, the holy day, God's Sabbath, to the Sunday as the church's new Christian Sabbath. Right, so we've gone from creation through the Old Testament, through the classical Greek philosophers. We've gone through the Hellenistic era into the New Testament time of Jesus and Philo and Paul. We've gone through to the uh, early church fathers, Justin and Origen. And now we're going to talk about Emperor Constantine. This is the 300s. In 321, Emperor Constantine is most well known for passing the first Sunday legislation. And it read like this. Let all the judges and town people and the occupation of all trades rest on the venerable day of the sun. But let those who are situated in the country freely and at full liberty attend to the business of agriculture. So here's the bottom line. Constantine is very simply, he's not coercing worship on the Sunday. He's not promoting church dogma or worship for the Sunday. All he's doing is creating a space in time. What he's doing is, I mean, really, it could be read as more in favor of pagan sun worship than anything else. But he's created the space and time when, when the citizens of his kingdom, everybody except in the agricultural trade because of seasons and the shortness of time and needing to get harvests and planting done and so on. Everybody else, all the shops were to close on Sunday, right? There should be no buying and selling. This was the earliest form of Sunday legislation. It was not a religious Sunday law. It was a secular civil Sunday law. But what it did was it created a space in time that needed to be filled. And the early Christian church, which has already begun this allegorical philosophical shift in understanding the scriptures, now suddenly has... In, in harmony with its teachings on the resurrection and, and its allegory of, of, of creation, Sunday, and so on and so forth, now suddenly has this legal time that is set aside for rest, which, which although the law itself is not overtly to promote the church or Sunday, is very convenient for an early church that's beginning to make that change. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, when we come down to... Um, the Council of Laodicea held in 365 AD. It actually happened over a number of years, but 365 AD, we read this from the church. Christians must not Judaize by resting on the Sabbath, but must work on that day, rather honoring the Lord's day. And if they can, resting then as Christians. But if any shall be found to be Judaizers, let them be anathema from Christ. Constantine passes a law in 321 AD, a secular civil law, creating a space and time for the Sunday when all must rest. Only a few years later, some 40 odd years later, a, an official authoritative church council meets and convenes, and they actually outlaw Sabbath keeping. So first came the civil Sunday law, and then came the church riding on the back of that, actually going way beyond the civil Sunday law and 
actively banning Sabbath keeping. And if you were a Sabbath keeper, then you were to be anathema, cut off from Christ. That's pretty strong language. So Constantine isn't the reason why the Sabbath changed in and of itself, but he provided an impetus and he's part of that grand narrative. The church is the one that comes along and says, Sabbath is now outlawed and banned. You must worship on Sunday and not on the Sabbath. After that, 349 to 407, a man lived who was named John Chrysostom. Now Chrysostom, John Chrysostom, uh, presented a number, of, a number of sermons against the Jews. That's what, they were, that's what it was called, against the Jews. And in his first homily, somewhere around 386 AD, he wrote the following words. He says, If any of you, whether you are here present or not, shall rush off to the synagogue or take part in fasting or share in the Sabbath or observe any other Jewish ritual, great or small, I call heaven and earth as my witnesses that I am guiltless of the blood of all of you. Now, John Chrysostom, this man has this series of homilies to convince his members when he's, the, when he's the presbyter at Antioch, he, he's trying to convince his people that they should have nothing to do with Jewish practices. And of course, lumped in there is the Seventh-day Sabbath. So we're seeing this trend, these Jewish, Christian, pagan factors, all the way from the time of, of, of classical Greek in the past, right through to the time of Jesus, right through beyond that, the church fathers, uh, Constantine and the pagan empire, and then right through beyond that, John Chrysostom, this anti-Semitism growing, the Sabbath being a symbol of that Jewish friendship and so on. And, and the result is that the Sabbath is being, being hated and Sunday is being promoted. But all the while, this is happening purely on the basis of rhetoric, purely on the basis of philosophical reasoning, of allegorical interpretation, nothing actually based in the Word of God itself. Then Pope Gregory the Great, 590 AD, one of the most well-known, well-loved uh, popes of all time. He did some amazing things to, to help the people of his time. He wrote these words, It has come to my ears that certain men of perverse spirit have sown among you some things that are wrong and opposed to the holy faith so as to forbid any work being done on the Sabbath day. What else can I call these but preachers of Antichrist? That was a powerfully strong words. So you've gone from this gradual shift, Sabbath keepers keeping Sabbath, sometimes Sunday, different pockets of believers doing different things, traveling down time. The teachers of the church are constantly pushing Sunday, constantly in stronger and stronger rhetoric, associating Sabbath with, with the Jews, and, and they're bad because they crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. And you've got the secular powers doing their thing, and, and eventually you come down to the Council of Laodicea and the church, outlawing Sabbath, and you've got the Pope later on actually having the audacity and the boldness to say that if you are encouraging Sabbath worship, you are in the spirit of Antichrist. Not just, I think you're wrong, but the strongest possible language. In more modern times, we read this in, on 23 September 1893 in the Catholic Mirror. The Christian Sabbath, or Sunday, is therefore to this day the acknowledged offspring of of the Catholic Church. Now with all the long narrative and story that I have shared with you thus far, you can understand the power of that statement. And I want you to understand this, Catholicism does not hide the fact that the Sabbath was shifted not on the basis of the authority of the Word of God, but on the basis of the authority of the Church. And they want it that way. You see, I, I puzzled. I puzzled for a long time over this. If, if I had made a change like that that was so contrary to the Word of God, I would have tried to hide it away and cover it up. Why are they so open about it? Because to them, they are the authoritative voice of Christ on earth today. To them, in Roman Catholic understanding, the Bible is good, but church tradition and authority is another source of divine revelation and, and authority. And where the two contradict, the church has the right to supersede in its traditions, in its teachings, in its authority, the Word of God. Because they are the living inheritors of the Spirit of God. They are the living, you know, the, the living Jesus Christ on earth today, as it were. And so they have the right to abrogate, to change, to adapt the Word of God to modern times. And you see, this was the key difference. This was the key split between Protestantism and Roman Catholicism when the Reformation began in the 15, 1600s. 
the idea was that the Protestant reformers were coming along and going, no, 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 wait a second, wait a second. We have to get back to the Bible and the Bible alone, sola scriptura, right? They were saying, we have to believe what the Bible says. If we start down this path, as we already have, of, of, of believing, you know, what church councils say and the Pope says, well, we end up with all these contradictions and all these changes that are contrary to the Word of God. We need to get back to the Bible and to the Bible alone. And that's the key schism, the key point of split between Catholicism and the Reformation. But the modern Catholic Church is happy to acknowledge this change is her baby, is her, is the reason is because of her authority. They want you to know that Sunday is their invention. They're not trying to hide that. And you'll understand why as we go along. So the Christian Sabbath Sunday is therefore to this day the acknowledged offspring of the Catholic Church. Carrying on in another quote, 1st of September 1923, the Catholic record. It says, Now in the matter of Sabbath observance, the Protestant rule of faith is utterly unable to explain the substitution of the Christian Sunday for the Jewish Saturday. Now just, just pause there for a moment. That Protestant rule of faith is what I was just explaining to you. The Protestant rule of faith, sola scriptura, the ones who believe that we must Take the Bible and the Bible alone, discarding human authority and church authority and church tradition. He's saying, hey, that Protestant rule, as great as it sounds, cannot explain the change from Saturday to Sunday. It has been changed, he says. The Bible still teaches that the Sabbath or Saturday should be kept holy. There is no authority in the New Testament for the substitution of Sunday for Saturday. Surely it is an important matter. It stands there in the Bible as one of the Ten Commandments of God. There is no authority in the Bible for abrogating this commandment or for transferring its observance to another day of the week. Now I just want to say a big hearty amen to that. I just want to say that this Catholic brother, I agree with him. There is no authority in Scripture for the change of the Sabbath. His argument is the Sabbath we know has been changed by church authority and church tradition. Here's another one in the Catholic record. We have in the authoritative voice of the church, the voice of Christ himself. The church is above the Bible. And this transference of Sabbath observance from Saturday to Sunday is proof positive of that fact. That's what I was saying earlier. Very simply stated, the Catholic Church wants you to know that there is no authority in Scripture to change Saturday to Sunday in terms of Sabbath observance. They want you to know that they have the authoritative voice of Christ, which implies that those who choose to continue observing Sunday as the Sabbath, the Christian Sabbath, are recognizing the authority of the Roman Catholic Church as supreme even over Scripture. The St. Catherine Catholic Sentinel, 1995, 21st of May, says, Perhaps the boldest thing, the most revolutionary change the church ever did, happened in the first century. The holy day, the Sabbath, was changed from Saturday to Sunday, not from any directions noted in the scriptures, but from the church's sense of its own power. Now, I want to encourage you to look up on the internet, on the Amazon Kindle store or some online bookstore. Look up this book entitled Rome's Challenge. Rome's Challenge is in fact a book publication of a series of articles written by Roman Catholic uh, scholars directly towards Sunday keeping Protestantism. And some of it I've already read from for just a phrase or two over there. But it's a profound, it's a profound collection of articles published as a book, Rome's Challenge. In this book, they challenge Sunday-keeping Protestantism to the fact that they are not holding true to the true Protestant rule of faith, sola scriptura, the Bible alone. Their argument is, you cannot find a reason in the Bible for changing Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. So every Protestant that keeps Sunday as the Sabbath is in fact acknowledging the authority of Rome. And therefore, what they're doing is they're saying, so just come home, stop protesting, end this breakaway from the mother church, from the Catholic church. You are already acknowledging the authority of the church in its right to establish Sunday over Saturday. So come home, my Sunday keeping daughters, my Sunday keeping Protestant churches. Come home to the mother church. The Council of Trent in the 1500s was convened to deal with the burgeoning Protestant movement. 
And in the Council of Trent, they needed to decide what are they going to do with these Protestants and their claim to the Bible and the Bible alone. They almost accepted the Protestant principle. Um, a number of the, the bishops and the priests who came there were actually in favor of this, of, of what the reformers were beginning to spread around, that we should set aside church tradition, that we should, that we should have the Bible and the Bible alone. And they, and, and they debated for days. They were deadlocked in the council on this issue of should we join the Reformation in essence? Should we accept the Protestant principle? Finally, after many days of deadlock, the Archbishop of Reggio came in. And you know what he did? He reasoned with them. And he used the, the Protestants, their own inconsistency, as a reason why the Catholic Church should not adopt the Protestant principle of sola scriptura, the Bible and the Bible alone. And guess which was the point that he actually used to demonstrate the inconsistency? Haha, <laughs> the Sabbath. Here's what he said, and I quote, The Protestants claim to stand upon the written word only. They justify their revolt by the plea, the revolt, the breakaway from the church. They justify their revolt by the plea that the church has apostatized from the written word and follows tradition. Their profession of holding the scripture alone as the standard of faith is false. And here's the proof. The written word explicitly enjoins the observance of the seventh day as the Sabbath. Yet they not only reject the observance of the Sabbath enjoined in the written word, but they have adopted and do practice the observance of Sunday for which they have only the tradition of the church. Consequently, the claim of Scripture alone as the standard fails and the doctrine of Scripture and tradition as essential is fully established, the Protestants themselves being the judges. So the Council of Trent almost accepted the Protestant principle, but in the end, on the basis of this reasoning, voted to condemn the Reformation precisely because of the inconsistency of the Protestants in the question of Sunday keeping. And, and I've got to wonder, how different would history be if, if Protestants had followed through the logic of their thought, even in reforming this back to the seventh day Sabbath? Now, I don't know. Maybe there would have been something else that would have been given as the reason why the Catholic Church shouldn't join the Reformation. But just the thought that the possibility that the Catholic Church itself could have joined the Reformation, how different would history have been? And then when you come down past the, the early Reformation, the mid-1600s, we have a group that ultimately become the Seventh-day Baptists, reforming in the Sabbath. We then have them passing that on to the Millerites in, 18, in the mid-1800s. A, a lady by the name of Rachel Oakes Preston introduces the Seventh-day Sabbath to these Sunday-keeping Millerites, believing and preaching in the certain return of Jesus. That ultimately grows into what we call the Seventh-day Adventist Church. This work of reform is continuing down through the ages. You see, here's the point. The Reformation did not end with those early reformers. It continues in this generation. You and I are a part of the stream of the Reformation and Sabbath is a part of the reforming doctrine, part of the Reformation that needs to be uncovered from the sands of time and lost in the, in the traditions of mankind. The Sabbath, you could say, is the modern day Mount Carmel where God gathered His people in that place and demonstrated that He was the true God, the Creator God, the Redeemer God by bringing fire down from heaven. When you choose to honor the seventh day Sabbath as the Sabbath of the Lord your God over and above ages of church tradition and family tradition and all the rest. You are standing on Mount Carmel and you are going, the Lord is God. He is the creator. He is the redeemer. His word is supreme. The Bible and the Bible alone. I am a part of that Protestant Reformation. I am going to reform in all things and follow the Lord in all things. He will be the authority in my life. I want to suggest to you that today, the seventh day Sabbath is God's call to know Him as the true God, the only God. He's calling you to reform and be a part of the legacy of the Reformation, to protest the errors of paganism and, and the compromise of Christianity. He wants you to step out and follow Him in faith. You are going to be a part of the Reformation. And He calls you to love Him through obeying His commandments and worshiping Him on the seventh day.